Hey, welcome everyone to Excel Q Live virtual event, the second edition. But today we're focusing on testing Oracle Cloud apps. To kick things off right, really excited to have joining us Heather, who is a senior principal product advisor at, HM, at HCM Cloud Customer Center of Excellence, North America at Oracle. So an awesome expert. She's also re often referred to as the Oracle apps testing guru. So really excited to have Heather join us. Hey, Heather, welcome to Excel Q Live. Hey, how are you? Great, great, great to have you join us. Really excited about your session. Um, like I said, you are known as the Oracle uh, testing guru. Uh, so really excited to have you join us. Great. And uh, um, I'll go ahead and do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, that'd be great. I have some slides to Perfect. show. Um, and then of course I'll share these with you um, post um, meeting, of course. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go over a lot of things and I'm going to talk as fast as I can because I know we have other people to speak as well. Um, it, it basically dovetails into what and how do you test with Oracle updates, right? So when you have the quarterly updates, how do you test? So this is me. Um, we just talked about it in the Center of Excellence Development Organization. And what we're going to talk about is updates when and how. Um, how do they get applied? How do you know what to update? Um, it's what's in the update and how to get started, right? So um, it's a lot, right? So we have a lot of different places in which customers can go look at to be able to understand the fundamentals behind Oracle updates. Documentation, MOS just stands for Oracle Support. There are key portals, um, Cloud Customer Connect, docs.oracle.com, Cloud Policies, Environments, Updates, and Patches. So how do we make sense of all of this, right? Um, I would say in the last um, five, 10 years, Oracle has done a really good job of trying to streamline the information and the release readiness area to be able to have customers understand where to go and how to get information to be successful. Um, Cloud Customer Connect is one of those places. This is where I tell most of my customers to start with because it's the sounding board for this release readiness area here, which we're going to walk through, um, which contains all the information in terms of documentation. So this is where you can get your information to understand both what to test and what new feature functionalities you want to deploy as an organization. So this, again, this area is what I was, has gotten the most um, improvement in terms of where to get the information. Now we have an actual Excel document um, that contains all of the feature functionality way back from the 19 series. The file now is about 10,000 rows of information. So if you're searching for particular functionality that you knew was de deployed in a certain release, you can just click on it and I can show you the Excel document here in a second when I get out of screen sharing mode. And then you can go look at it and there's a deep link in there. It takes you right to the documentation. You don't have to henpeck. You don't have to figure out how to get there. It takes you right to the pictures and sometimes even a video of how to deploy that functionality. So um, the update policy, again, just when <clears throat> are you consuming updates in your environments? How are you knowing what's coming when? So it all based upon... Um, the deployment schedule within Oracle Cloud. Hopefully everybody on the call understands what that is. If not, um, there are cohorts called A, B, and C. There's four releases a year. And depending upon which wave that you're on, we call them cohorts, but which, which month of the year that you get the updates, um, <clears throat> that'll be your, your timing for that. And just let me know if there's any questions as we go through. If you guys see anything in the question that people have questions about, just throw them at me and we can um, discuss them. Um, in the update policy, again, the quarterly updates and the reason why we're talking about the quarterly updates so much is because that dovetails into testing and that dovetails into automation and why that's so important. Um, because you want to get your top of stack to testing remediation done with an automatic form. And then you can do more um, corner cases that we like to call them or more complex cases manually or with your functional teams. So again, 
this is what I just talked about, the four quarterly updates, A, B, and C. And then I created this, di- this diagram because it's really, really powerful in terms of visually understanding when those updates are going to hit your environment. So if we think about today, we are in cohort B in the June timeframe. So customers just received on 617, if you're in cohort B, 22B in your environment. Um, again, 22A is for May, was, was in May for A. So A, B, and C. Um, Typically, customers who have payroll are in that first cohort or that first wave, as we like to say. So being able to plan for this, which is really nice. So now we have a standard operating procedure as it relates to when things are going to come out so that you can have your um, HR calendar dovetail into when Oracle updates happen. And then this is a really big one. So we send out notifications to individuals that have cloud admin access in the application. Um, This is the way we communicate with you in terms of when your environment goes down, when your updates are going to happen, any kind of maintenance that needs to happen in your environment. We always talk about how do other users in your um, company understand where this is located. Um, you want to add them right to that contact tab, or you want to create your own um, email distribution list and make sure that they get those notifications. Um, this just goes back into the Vertex updates, 19th and the 25th. You don't have to test for those, but the updates are out there. Those are a hot, hot patching. There's no, there's no downtime for those. I'm going through this quickly because I want to get into the meat of the actual testing scenarios, but I wanted to make sure that people understood the fundamentals um, behind it. So this is really getting into the content that we want to talk about today. So quarterly updates and testing plans. So like I mentioned, we have done a really good job of doing the release readiness of the content um, and understanding from a functional perspective, what should you be testing? What is 90% of your application 90-10 rule or, or 80-20 rule, depending upon your organization. What are the things in your organization from a top level that you need to test for to ensure that happens on day one after you get the update? Can you pay somebody? Can you hire somebody? Can you transfer somebody? Can you give somebody benefits? These are all things that don't change from a functional perspective very often. But what they do um, do is... Um, you want to make sure that you're testing that top of stack to ensure that you're not going to have any problems. There's also a known issues article that you can download. Um, That gives you an understanding of things that have been fixed. And just to know, when we talk about um, fixes in a lot of cases, because customers' um, environments are set up differently, um, your feature functionality set is going to be different than somebody else's and your data truly is as well. So sometimes when we have feature um, updates, it may be a fix for only one customer because it's a corner case in terms of how they've configured the application. Um, So just to to note that when you see the list of the known issues, they may not relate to you or they may relate to products that you don't have. So again, this is just the information center as it relates to legislative information from a payroll perspective. Um, how to make sure you get hot topics because hot topics is going to send you that legislative information from a payroll perspective. Again, just making sure that you understand the the timing in which you need to be able to test for in those two weeks. How are you going to be able to get that testing done? And this is where we and I'm going to go through these really quickly because we're going to go we're going to talk right here on the continuous um, of what what to test and why to test how to test, what tools, regression, and automation, and how to get started, okay? So I kind of put together this um, white paper, right, for a lot of customers who don't really understand what regression or automation testing actually means. Um, How do you actually prepare for automation and testing? So what is automation testing, right? We call it ART internally, and Oracle's approach on regression testing. How do you get started? How is it different than what you currently do? So when I first talk to customers about testing, it's really important to understand where you're starting from. Do you just say, okay, Betty, go test payroll. Sally's testing benefits and Tom is testing um, time time and labor, for an example. 
Um, do you give them walkthroughs? Do you give them actual use cases that they need to go test on? Is it very rigorous in terms of how they're testing, when they're testing, and why they're testing? So what we find is customers who decide they're going to do automation testing, it gets them really, really super organized um, on how they're testing. So it gets them those scripts. Um, and the scripts we talk about is something that we do in QA. We test thousands of scenarios. But it's that scenario level where you need to look at from a QA perspective, from an Oracle perspective, it says, these are the work streams if, by product line that you need to or should be testing from a high level, right? Okay, well, then how do you do that, right? We have click-by-clicks as well that we can share. So click-by-click scenarios, which are vanilla that you can add to. But how can you take it one step further and automate that process versus having everybody have hands on keyboard, being able to consume the testing and do it manually? Because what we really want is on day one, when you have that two-week window, we really want on day one after your environment comes back up um, on sometimes on Saturday um, timeframe, you want to be able to know and run your automated scripts on day one to say what's passed and what's failed. Because we have you know, a very short window to ensure that that, inf- that um, testing scenario can either be remediated or fixed prior to your put going into production. So uh, any questions so far out there? Actually, we do have one question. They wanted to know about uh-huh. uh, how can we get the calendar for Oracle ERP Cloud staging production and testing window? It's the same as HCM. ERP is linked with HCM. So if you're in finance or ERP, it's the same delivery schedule. Okay. No different. Perfect. Great question though. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, that's all we have so far. Okay, great. So I just talked about this a little bit. What is regression testing? And, um, you know, way back when people were like, oh, well, Oracle doesn't allow regression testing. Well, that's true in production, right? But not in the lower environment any longer. So we have updated our cloud hosting and policy delivery to allow users to be able to do regression testing, right? So you're scripting for a user, in this case, to be able to go through the application just like you would if you were um, behind your keyboard, right? So we're not talking about load testing or performance testing where you're sending thousands and thousands of scenarios. These are very critical scenarios in order to make sure that your application works as intended after an update, right? So it's very similar if you guys are familiar with or have implemented any any products, doesn't have to be Oracle, um, what's called user acceptance testing or system integration testing, SIT. These are very similar use cases that you would go through to make sure the application works as intended, right? So that's what we're talking about. But now... It's not the same level when you're locked, right? So you shouldn't have to be doing a full suite of regression testing for your entire application. Again, top of stack, top of mind of this, the key critical things you want to be able to um, test for. So how do you prepare for it, right? So we want to go through the standard workflows, right? You want to understand what those are. And when we talk about vendors, which we'll get into here in a minute, we're really you know, vendor agnostic because each company, each um, decides on what's best for them. We have some customers who have huge Selenium um, houses that um, do regression testing on every single application they own and they write run scripts all day long. Great. We have some customers who have two people in HR and they're supporting their system. They don't have that knowledge, expertise or time, money, energy. So there's outsourcing that can happen. Right, and then there's a there's a hybrid of those. So the great thing right now is that with all of these testing services or products that are out there, it gives you that benefit of being able to consume the testing quickly, um, and then not really ha- having to know how to code. Right. So there's there's something for everybody in terms of their level of sophistication around coding and, and around regression testing. So again, starting off of what are your standard workflows and what are you testing? 
especially with payroll and staging that and doing the rollback and then pre and post test that gives you your best chance for success, uh, especially when it comes to the sophistication of payroll. So what to consider before you're testing, before you take on automation? What, again, what are your manual tests that you currently have? Get your team together um, from all the functional, um, technical, different work streams and kind of start consuming all of those. The good news, again, we have a lot of that repository, so you don't have to start from scratch um, of knowing what those are. What are the top 300 or 500 scripts that I should be looking at as an organization? And what are the impacts or any impacts that I might have from that release readiness documentation? <clears throat> so again, we talked about Selenium as the tool. And the reason why we started with the automation regression testing, uh, what now, five, six years ago? And we started with Selenium. And the reason why is because it's free. Um, so we didn't want customers to have to pay for something additional. So it's freeware. So you're able to download it um, for free and be able to utilize it. Um, so that's an option if you have, um, the, again, the team or the knowledge of how to write in Selenium. Um, if not, there's many partners out there, which we'll talk about, um, to be able to consume. Um, and I, we talked about the hosting and delivery policy already, that it allows you to do this. Um, again, first identifying the manual scripts. We've talked about that several times. This, the documentation here just kind of walks you through that um, to ensure that you understand um, what to test and what not to test. And then this is kind of an example. Um, this is edit tax withholding, right? So this is a script per se that you would be writing, um, but it gives you the design steps. So it gives you the actual click by click scenario and how you would stage data when you're talking about doing manual testing that then you convert your manual testing into actual scripted automation testing. So this is just an example of that code line. Um, so you can kind of understand it. And then being able to understand, again, why you would want to do automation testing, we have static IDs in the application from a responsive UI perspective. So if you are coding in like a Selenium, for an example, those are static IDs. And those static IDs then don't change from version to version. So before we used to have about 30% dropout from scripts to scripts, but now you don't have to worry about that. Um, so how is, how is this different? As I just talked about utilizing the element IDs between releases, those don't change. So that was a very um, positive thing when we moved over to the responsive UI. Um, again, you don't have to use Selenium. You can use any testing platform that you'd like as long as it's a DOM or document object model for the locators. Concepts, again, static IDs versus fusion element locators. Again, I'm going very quickly. I know you have limited time. Um, basic concepts, wild carding, complex locators. Again, we'll share this deck. You guys will be able to consume it at your leisure. Um, you can yourself look at the web inspector to kind of understand information. This is a screenshot of being able to look at that web inspector. Again, if you're not a coder, if you don't understand the, the coding behind it, it's perfectly okay. As we mentioned, there's a lot of vendors out there that you can go through the UI and machine learning, clicking on the UI itself that creates the scripts for you, right? So there's a lot of different ways in which you can consume automated regression testing without having to build scripts. And then the rest of the deck just goes through a more um, deep dive into actually building your scripts, right? In terms of the language behind it um, and then getting the boxes behind it. So I wanted to make sure that we, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and go through to, here we go. So these are the partners. And then this is the slide that I'll probably end on and we can ask questions, we can ask questions if they'd like. So Automation testing partners, right? So a lot of the different SIs out there who implement with you have, have, have services, testing services, Scenario Tech, um, Excel Q, as, we, as we're talking about today, and then Autonomic, right? So it depends upon, again, what you're trying to go solve for. I was just out in Vegas for two weeks, and I must have met 10 different partners 
who are doing automation regression testing, which is fabulous because we see it as a game changer for you, not only for the updates to be able to consume um, with, with um, feeling really good about that, you're not going to have any regressions, but also being able to consume newness quicker because you're then going to be able to do regression testing against your new functionality. So it's going to be able to, for you to be able to um, consume newness faster in your organization. So again, this is more of a philosophy than it is an approach of what tool should I use. Um, so we really see the benefits of customers who do this because on day one, they're able to understand if they have any regressions. Yes or no, pass, fail, right? That's really the benefit of it um, versus finding out on week two because somebody was out of the office and didn't get a chance to test payroll on a retro basis and then you have an issue, right? That's really a hard thing to have to, to, to try to, to spin around. So these are just some questions you can be asking yourself on how to get ready for um, automation regression testing. Um, it's again, it's a philosophy. Um, it, um, being able to um, get yourself very, very organized as an organization. And then many customers, as we've mentioned, end up outsourcing it to a third party just because of the ease of use. Great. And this just talks about the reason why in terms of the, um, the risk for the demand of capabilities in the application. What questions do we have? Right, Heather, we have quite a few, actually. Uh, so let's oh, good. bring them up. First one is, yeah. how do you consider opt-in expiration ACM ERP cloud during each, uh, every upgrade? So opt-in, so you're talking about new feature functionality opt-in? I assume they are. If not, uh, please uh, give some clarification whoever asked that question, but I believe they are. Yeah, so you would just, you would add those to your script scenarios. And again, based upon the feature functionality of the, what's new documentation and looking at the release readiness notes, what, what has changed that you need to be able to add to your design? Like what things in the UI have changed that or, or a, a process flow has changed you need to go test for? So that would be building it based upon the release notes, right? So what, what do you need to go look at and make sure of um, when you're doing that? And sometimes if they're corner cases, you can do those manually. But then again, all of that heavy lifting from an automated standpoint are being done with the regression scripts. Uh, someone wants to know, is there any automated mechanism for identifying impacted test suites? Um, yeah. So when you go to the release readiness information that I mentioned, there's actually a functional guide that gives you impact analysis within each product line. So it actually gives you a grid in that um, release readiness documentation that tells you high, medium, low, and whether it's turned off or turned on um, upon deployment. And then what that level of effort is for each individual feature. Hopefully that helps. Absolutely. All right. So next question is, uh, is there any recommended best practices with respect to a uh, maximum and minimum number of regression cycles? Yeah. So, um, you know, I always tell people that as long as you've run through the, you know, the critical regression scripts as it relates to payroll, retro, um, hiring people, um, terminating people, transferring people, benefits, the things that really matter in your organization, as long as you run through those scenarios once and you have regression scripts for the top of the stack, then you should be good, right? Where I think it's hard is when you don't have a solid testing foundation and you're kind of just henpecking your testing. Um, you, you don't capture everything, right? You don't capture the things that matter through the entire workflow from beginning to end. You'll test individual features. But again, as we all know, the suite is combined within ERP and CX and HCM and data moves throughout the application. So being able to test that beginning to end processes is really important. Perfect. All right, questions keep coming. Next one is... Uh, 
With Oracle having quarterly releases, how can testers be proactively prepared? Yeah, so the good news is that we actually release two, two months prior to GA um, the new release. So 22C, which is going is coming out, right, has already been le- released um, on June 3rd. So every two months prior to GA, on that first Friday of the month, we come out with release notes. So you have an entire two months or two and a half months, really, to look at release readiness, impact analysis um, before that next release hits your environment. And if you're on not on cohort A and you're on cohort B, then you get three months. And if you're on cohort um, C, then you get you get four months, right? So we we have been proactively releasing that information a lot sooner than we used to. Nice. Great information. So next question is, is it necessary to test financial reporting, OTBI-based scenarios for every upgrade? It is. um, With the release readiness, we do have OTBI um, report areas. So it's it's impactful to understand if any of those um, report areas have changed. And I always say, again, what reporting are you utilizing in your organization that you send downstream or to um, individuals to do their day in day out job? So maybe not all reports are that important that they're they're ancillary to your organization, but they're not something that's making your organization work. But like pay files you're sending to a third party like ADP or something, or time files to pay people, those things that you're using, um, utilizing either an OTBI or a BIP reports are important. Great answer. All right, so this is a good question as well. Uh, does Oracle have pre-written scripts that they share with customers? So we have pre-written um, scenarios, right? So we have like the workflows, what you should be testing by pillar, right? So, and I'm happy to share that with this team of what we currently have. I think there's several hundred on that list. And then if you want the actual click by clicks, I can get you those as well. But we do share those because it's just basically going through the UI, but we don't want customers to have to um, build those from scratch, right? Have to go through the, the keystrokes or the clicks. But again, that goes back to the automation um, with the the testing folks to be able to help you with that as well. But yes, we can definitely give you the the high level in terms of, I have them for HCM. I'm sure that we have them for the other pillars as well. Great, all right. So here's a question you might get asked a lot, and it is, over a period of time, does the jobs in QA will get decreased or like manual tester or automated tester? So what you all look for? testers in general, uh, especially with Oracle app testing, seems to be more and more automated, but I guess they're they're curious to know your opinion. Um, So the question is, do we see more automation in testing? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, so we we are finding that customers who utilize testing um, and and start the process, of course, it's always a, um, you you know, it takes time in the beginning. But the benefit outweighs any of the time in the beginning, because the more automation you have, the more time that you have, the more freedom that you have to be able to consume, like I said, mentioned before, the newness, new feature functionality sets, and then being able to test that those those corner cases in your environment, in your in your company that could bite you, right? That you're doing on an off cycle basis or whatever is coming out um, that you can test for. But automation, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So, like I said, a lot of questions are coming in. Next one is <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, that's <it's> awesome. <laughs> and you're knocking them out of the park. So, thank you for that. Really quick. So, that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you manage test uh, automation of UI, API, spreadsheet uh, based scenarios? So, I'm I'm guessing that you're talking about you have an API that you're currently utilizing from maybe you're sending data for, to an external source. So you're trying to um, retrieve data. I'm not sure exactly what, you know, if they're talking about, if they're writing scripts from an API. So I'm trying to understand what the, the model is there. But again, you can 
you can automate any of the, you know, testing scenarios you're trying to, um, to work with. But again, having your environments and your P to T's set for your lower environment, so you can test all your integrations and you can test your APIs. Great. All right. So now it's all the questions coming in. I think this one may have been pre-submitted and it is. What advice would you give other teams or organizations planning to kick off the journey in test automation? I just say, just do it, right? Just start. Um, again, look at all the different vendors, decide in your organization who has the skill sets. Do you want to consume it yourself? Do you want to utilize a third party? Um, to be able to do it. There's so much um, available to you. Some of them have machine learning where you're clicking in the UI and you're building your own scripts and then you can run them. There are companies that do the full suite of testing for you and then give you an output, right? Did it pass or fail? Um, and there's hybrid approaches to both. Um, so just get started because it's going to save you a ton of money, time, and energy um, as you go through this process, because you're really, really, again, you're going to refine your testing suites. Um, and then you're going to feel more empowered because you know exactly what to test, how to test and when to test. Perfect. Okay. Another question is what is the maximum number of days, uh, for every upgrade for a uh, complete regression? So, um, so basically in most cases, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll explain most here, you have two weeks, right, to test between you get it in your lower environment, your stage environments, that first Friday of every single month, and then you get it in your third Friday of every single month of, of, of that month for quarterly updates. You get that on that third Friday. So basically, you have two weeks to test. Now, there are some caveats to that. So if you do what's called soap testing, um, which I'm a part of, um, customers consume the application a month prior to GA. So they have a month and a half to test the application, right? Those are SOAP customers. We have about 35 very, very, very large strategic customers in the program. Anybody can submit a request for it if you'd like to. Um, then we also have on the other end, we have what's called A6, which you can consume a version on that first Friday of the month, and then you don't get it in production until the following month. So it's a month and a half, basically, just on the other end. So, but for most customers, it's just a two week window of being able to consume it and then test for it. That's why it's really, really important that you have your regression scripts because then on that first day, you have your high level taken care of, right? And then that first week, you should always consume and have all of your payroll testing done that first week. And then you have your other pillars the second week. So that's really kind of um, from, your, from a functional standpoint, the additional testing that you're doing like hands on keyboard, but you want to make sure that all your payroll and workflows are done that first week. Great. All right. So I don't know, think I've ever run an event the past year or so where someone doesn't ask something about AI machine learning. Don't know if you have any opinions <laughs> on it, Heather, but you must get this asked all the time. You said you would just set a bunch of shows in, in Vegas. So <clears throat> has, yeah, oh, how, we, how, yeah, any thoughts on this AI machine learning? Yeah. Yeah, we have, um, I have a whole entire slide that I just actually showed in this last meeting that I was on prior to this meeting. We have a whole entire deck on AI machine learning, right? So we in the application um, have um, embraced machine learning, um, not necessarily from a testing perspective, but it is embedded in testing. So when I talk about that, there's machine learning and algorithms from different companies that are doing testing scenarios to be able to build those scripts for you, right? So that's, that's kind of baked into some of the vendors that I've talked with. Um, but we also have machine learning um, and um, AI um, from a functional standpoint in the application as well. So how to pick the best ma match or fit from a recruiting standpoint, or what to serve up to you from a learning perspective, or you know, where is your talent in terms of the application? So that's getting a little bit in terms of the visioning of the HCM application in total, but it's totally baked into the application. Perfect. All right, Heather, I think we have time for about one more question. And sure. 
I think you kind of touched on this already with one of the others is uh, where do you see the future of test automation heading and how vital is no-code test automation's role um, in, in this particular journey in test automation? Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's incredible. Like just when I started the art program within Oracle, like six years ago, nobody really kind of understood it, right? Um, it was, wasn't something that we did. Um, and now it's just so prevalent and it just becomes second nature for individuals to, 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 to do automation. Um, anything that we don't have to do manually anymore, there's no reason to, right? So we're just trying to give people time back because a lot of people have you know, more work than they have time. And a lot of, of teams are smaller because of the, you know, war, war on talent that we currently have. So being able to make things work um, better, faster, stronger, smarter, you know, those types of things versus harder is always beneficial. Great. And someone just wrote in the chat, I don't know if you know anything about this, is um, they want to know, in one of the slides, you showed some testing tools, but they said they didn't see OATS Oracle testing tool. So oh yeah, you, you certainly can use. You can certainly use Oats. It now works with um, um, HCM. There was some components there many several years ago that didn't work. You can use Oats. It's just you have to you have to pay for it, right? Gotcha. If you if you if you own it already and you're using it, you can definitely use it with um, the SaaS application. Perfect. Good call out. Yeah, cool. So Heather, those are all the questions we have. I want to thank you so much. You did an excellent job, really thorough. So we really appreciate you for joining us and uh, sharing your knowledge with the our, our Excel Q Live. Really appreciate you. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Wow. What a great session. Like I said, uh, show some Heather some love. All right. Big round of applause. She got right through all those questions. So thank you everyone for participating with your questions. This is really what makes uh, the event really successful is by you participating, your questions. A few people are asking for live demos. If you want a live, live demo, you want to wait to the end where Giljeet will be demonstrating a live demo. We have Uday up next. He um, he talks about real world experience as an automation engineer actually doing automation. I don't think there's a demo piece to it, but... If you stay to the end, Gelji will actually do a demo as well. So if for everyone that's looking for a demo, you want to hang in all the way to the end. So definitely sit back, relax, and enjoy the next session. Uh, good, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Uday. I'm from Capgemini. I'm having total 20 years of experience in Oracle, eBusiness Suite, as well as in Cloud. I'm currently working as an architecture architect in, uh, in Capgemini, managing Oracle Cloud uh, testing suite of application. Okay, as well as managing other product portfolio where I'm like uh, defining go to market strategy and uh, working with practice leadership to help them and help customers to you know, go on the accelerators and you know rapid environment and development. So yeah, that's my short introduction. Okay, so let me uh, move on uh, to the next slide. So today I've got an opportunity to uh, present myself, you know, uh, in partnership with SLQ uh, to uh, provide and list down the challenges, uh, whatever we're facing in Oracle world, uh, it's pre-SLQ and then, you know, how is our life in post-SLQ. So today I'm going to brief you about, you know, some of the challenges which we face in managing our Oracle testing uh, uh, suit or testing cloud applications, you know, uh, in Capgemini. So uh, there are laundry list of challenges. So we have picked, you know, few of the challenges which you know uh, probably like help everyone uh, here to understand what we are talking about. And these challenges are really important challenges because uh, this actually defines our go-to-market strategy as well as the hindrance in you know uh, cloud development, uh, which has been reported by uh, customers across you know multiple sectors as well. So uh, basically, uh, what we found is right. Uh, Oracle actually upgrades their quarterly patches uh, very frequently. So, like every quarter, we receive a new patch and new upgrade version, and it's like a global upgrade. So it impacts all the models. So these quarterly patches has you know very short duration. So whenever you get ready for the another you know uh, for the one patch for all your regression testing the another patch is like you know on your doorway so 
it depends on the choices like you know customers go for a monthly patch quarterly patch but then there's a big challenge to you know uh, maintain this patch with you know correct uh, application functionality and you know it needs a lot of validation and testing so uh, that's a big challenge and you know we are looking at some accelerators and i, I know uh, accelerators or applications which can help and i think uh, slq has really helped us a lot okay so we'll see it in you know uh, consecutive slides post slq like how we how we overcome these challenges so another thing is right uh, that execution cycle uh, oracle needs it very uh, like you know it's very demanding the reason is like uh, it involves multiple business process and multiple uh, validation cycles such as you know uit uh, sit uh, integration testing right and uh, that's for multiple waves right so it's not like you know one uh, big bang implementation it's like a multiple iteration of your implementation so that's the execution cycle so it needs a frequent execution of your scripts okay so we are like it's a big challenge that you have to execute the same scripts again and again you have to perform regression testing and you have to ensure that you know all your patches and the regression is thorough so that's another challenge okay and that's like very uh, profound for Oracle cloud applications uh, another challenge what we saw is like you know integration because uh, Oracle uh, uh, like customers depends on you know their legacy applications and other third party applications banks and you know financial institutes so there is a lot of integration Oracle cloud works with and then you know there's a challenge of in you know uh, performing integration testing and thoroughly test all your integrations right before you move or exit your uh, SIP or UAT. So that's very critical and that's one of the big challenge for we face. Uh, because of integration, right? So we totally uh, rely on the REST APIs or web services, as well as, you know, CSV file import export functionality, right? File load, uh, load and all. Uh, so these are all things, right? Actually multiplies our challenges and, you know, uh, you know gives us a tough time, right? That all your SOAP APIs and you know, REST APIs are you know, thoroughly to be uh, validated because there are so many uh, situations that all your third party may not be ready, but you know, your SOAP API uh, development team keeps you, you know, keeps up to the mark. So you have to keep it validated and patch can again change the signature. So, you know, so testing the SOAP API, uh, it's, it's a big challenge, okay? And uh, really SAP helps us a lot, okay? We'll see it in detail, okay? So uh, quickly move to the next uh, slide, okay? Uh, since like everything is an agile fashion, cloud is not exception to it. So what happens is like uh, agile, due to agile demand, sorry, due to agile demand, uh, we expect like our testing is also agile, okay? So uh, we, you know, uh, basically need, you know, something uh, who, which manages our testing entire development in agile fashion. So that's a like a times demand, it's a clouds demand, and it's an agile demand. So it's like one of the challenge, okay? Uh, then uh, since cloud ERP is totally all the business processes, like it, it takes profit to pay, record to report, you know, projects to profit. So if you compare, so like everything from finance to supply chain and HRMS, like human resource management, so everything is business process. And customer would like to actually test uh, validate their uh, their production scenarios with their business process. Okay, so they give more focuses on business process. So we need something where uh, you know where uh, a testing suit can give you the end-to-end -end business process flow. And since it's a heavily business demand, we wanted to capture the scenarios and scripts and the entire flow in in the in the business pass, uh, fashion way where customers you know uh, demands or customers needs it. Uh, then that brings a reusability factor because you know you are frequently uh, connecting with you know common application modules or common functionality, or there are centralized applications which connects with all of the other applications. So this is a reusability factor a lot, right? Because you, know, you will end up in, in performing same testing again and again, okay? And uh, we need that end-to-end -end testing to be completed. So that's a, one of the big challenges that we need a reusability so that you know we can quickly uh quickly develop uh the scripts you know on top of it and not to like you know start from a scratch so that's what you know the big challenge to uh get our reusability and you know uh increase our go-to-market uh, footprints also okay 
so yeah that's uh, another challenge uh, i believe like one more challenge we face is like uh, since it's all different kinds of module okay and all the user base try to perform a testing at the same time and there is a big bang there is a big bang approach uh, and there is a, a wave by approach a phase by approach right so uh, all your modules need to be tested you know before you exit from one phase to another phase and that brings a challenge that you know, all the parallel testing uh, is very important because uh, uh, in in cloud and the agile uh, world uh, where the timelines are get shrink right your testing is also get shrink so we need some dynamic uh, accelerators you can perform parallel testing in 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 really quick time in in an actual agile way all right so let's uh, let's discuss you know our life uh, pre slq era okay and it is tough life definitely tough life so uh, we just try to portray you know, some of the artifacts and the, some of the pointers which actually gives you a highlight like you know what all the uh, issues we slq era we were like uh, facing so in tech depth okay uh, because of all the things like right, challenges which i uh, described earlier right so uh, specifically reusability factor okay where like we are not able to uh, reuse our scripts okay to one extent it was uh, reusable but for to the mass extent where the customers demand uh, it was very difficult to reuse the scripts okay and other thing is like execution cycles are very short but our execution cycles are very long and uh, the, uh, it was a very rich, difficult to you know manage the executions parallelly uh, okay with dependency of modules okay so uh you know these like cumulative added uh effect okay in order to like define our go-to-market strategy and actually align our go-to-market strategy rapidly with you know customers uh adaptive change okay and uh, like the the way technology was actually uh, uh rapidly moving we were like trying to catch up okay, in the testing phase so so the, that's what the major challenge is like you know uh and time to get market uh, with uh, with this uh, such kind of a uh, sluggish testing and uh, and a lack of good uh, uh, features, so which were making our tech tech very high. Okay. The maintenance, I believe, like there was uh, uh, a big issue is like managing our quarterly patches because there's so much of frequent patches, so much of you know changes. So we have to actually adapt and make the R scripts, okay, uh, to you know manually go and modify our scripts and you know, uh, maintain it uh, with very high cost, okay. But you have to put resources on that. Uh, the resources need to be trained. Your quarterly patches need to be captured properly. Your scripts to be aligned. You have to version your quarterly patches because of your backport. Then all your scripts should you know work on the backport and opt-in opt-out features based on the customer to customer. So that's one of the biggest challenges in you know, maintaining those scripts. Okay. So uh, again, you know that leads us to you know fulfill customers' uh, demand in the accelerated environment, and uh, that delays our go-to-market uh, strategy as well as like catching up with other competitors. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's that that was like very tough for uh, us uh, SL2 era, and uh, reporting was like one of the big challenge and uh, big issues we face. So, for example, like there were the executive reports which we wanted, okay, and uh, the tool has a limitation capability uh, which we were using it, okay. So uh, there are different kind of uh, power users, okay. Um, we need analysis of all our defects and test cases. So these were like a little bit, uh, you know, quite lacking okay, in pre SLQ era and world. So uh, we really wanted the reporting to be like uh, you know, out of box, should give full fledged other dimensions. So not getting it uh, is one of the uh, key issues we face. Okay. Uh, again, I spoke about you know at the time of challenges we are aligned with agile development uh, fashion, okay, and our, all implementations are agile based. Customer expects uh, the scripts, uh, scripts you know, creation in the agile fashion mode. So uh, 
and 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 customer expects that you know all your testing management should be uh, automatically or you know at least pretty integrated with the agile development tools such as jira and valley so that was uh, another challenge because like the user stories being developed in silos and then those user stories gets loaded and we use for creation of our scripts and you know uh, much of the time the user story criteria and the requirements you know this got changes so then it aligns so these are like you know a big big challenge in the reporting and the synchronization process these are the lack of capabilities of our testing uh, to SLQ, uh, which was like, majorly impacting uh, the delivery. Okay. The absence of integration and CICD were like always uh, there, okay, and thank you for that. SLQ actually brings and help us to close that gap. Uh, resources is another key challenge in every delivery because uh, when we plan, we plan our functional, technical, and testing resources, and that's a part of the QA team separately. So uh, for like pre SLQ era, like you know, uh, our test agents, you can say, or the test resource, testing resources need to be thoroughly skilled on the particular platform. They should understand the business, okay, and then uh, they should align with customers' processes and get the, uh, the customer environment you know, completely uh, tuned you know, with, with the test scripts development and test deployment and the test cases changes and all. So there's a steep learning curve, like if resources leaves in between, okay, it's getting another resources on board and then train it uh, thoroughly and get up to the speed was a really difficult challenge, okay. And then getting that particular screen resource on the public platform has understanding of the coding, you know, and help is in building the script is totally resource dependent and not process dependent. So there's a, like a heavy dependency uh, with, with resource, uh, the resources must learn coding okay and then uh, there's a total dependency in overall the time overall timeline and delivery of the project okay because without QA you cannot move forward so that's uh, that's a key challenge uh, pre SLQ world we are facing uh release and alignment uh, i think i spoke about it you know a uh, couple of times before or uh, during when i was explaining about the challenges so that's a very critical uh, uh stage okay of, of the project when you go live and then there are quarterly releases you have to catch up and you have to maintain you know all your scripts to up to up, up to the uh, exact or current uh release pack okay whatever whatever uh Develop. So maintaining that uh, release alignment, your scripts, performing a regression testing, okay, performing a thorough validation testing uh, during that such a short span of time. So that was a, a big challenge, specifically on the Oracle Cloud view, okay. And um, for instance, like you know, uh, when Oracle brings a UI updates, right? So that's like a major changes, uh, uh, user interface changes where uh, you know like the functionality gets changed and then that testing need to be thoroughly uh, thoroughly conducted so so these are the like you know uh, a, a big challenge uh, we face so okay so here is a very good part of post slq life okay which we are really happy after getting slq on board it uh, and we we have used SLQ you know, quite extensively uh, internally as well as with client, and we really found uh, it has really helped us life improved a lot. Okay, so a few of the snippets I'm trying to you know uh, walk through you, all of you so that we'll understand like what you know uh, the message I'm trying to give over here. Okay, so uh, basically like I describe all the challenges and uh, the issues uh, which we were facing you know pre SLQ life. Okay, these actually, most of these issues I have overcome uh, when we got SLQ on board. Okay, so uh, the major thing is what we found is like our delivery cycle uh, has improved a lot. Okay, uh, the testing coverage has improved a lot. Okay, we were able to manage our parallel testing. So our test execution cycles have improved a lot. Okay, and then the reusability factor really improved a lot. The best feature what I found about the SMQ is no coding uh, platform. So the resources are like simply, uh, you know, they can just take a screenshot and then 
start uh, creating the scripts in the background okay so they can align the scripts uh, mainly most of the elements the components or the parts okay of scripts are reusable so you can bundle it within the module you can bundle it within uh, the within the phases and processes and you can reuse it okay so uh, for instance like common functionality scripts scheduling processes you know reviewing reports uh, you know uh, running jobs so all those things right so these are can be bundled reused uh, quite like very frequently in all your models so overall uh you know if you look at right so that gives us uh, a very you know good strength in delivery and our delivery cycles improves and that brings builds our confidence and uh you know that gives us that help us in uh you know catching with competitors like being ahead from you know the competitors and getting uh go to market uh strategy well in time and connecting with the customers and demoing them uh, you know the the bright features and um, helping customers to plan their journey and get on board so yeah that's uh, overall like you know uh, very you know speedy delivery i want to like go in a little tip like if you look at maintenance uh, as i already explained uh, the cost has reduced because there is no more resource dependencies again uh, the quarterly patches uh because of reusability your scripts are intact that there is a traceability you are managing using slp uh, platform that if there are changes in a script it highlights in in their entire universe where all the changes are it's impacted so it's easy to trace and identify the changes okay so you can go and then make the changes and fix that entire flow at, at, at the same time because you are making the changes all throughout the script so the traceability is improved a lot and that helps us in you know, bring transparency in delivering our scripts and getting aligned with our you know our quarterly patches or frequent patches or frequent changes uh, because cloud is like continuous change environment the requirements are change your new patches new opt-in features comes up ui changes so all these changes right uh, as if you was like uh, adapting it very very smartly and then we help like it was like total help for us to be a delivery ready as well as help in hyper care and you know, post hyper care support also so maintenance has really reduced a lot mm. uh, oracle alignment i think i spoke about it uh, okay because um, all your real time uh, changes okay all your real time patches are now aligned and uh, your scripts are like completely uh, because of no coding platform it's like uh, almost real time we are able to uh get the changes done uh quickly perform the validation and the regression testing and and get our scripts move from one environment to other environment but that environment shift is so easy that you know just like connect to the new url and you know uh, uh just point to the new environment and you know get your scripts ready with the easy way to upload your data okay a test data so that management is really very good uh, uh provided by slq and that really aligns with oracle you know because of uh, the no coding or you can say pre-built code list ssrs okay uh, i already spoke about no coding skills which really improves resource confidence uh it helps them uh you know focus more on uh of business process changes a business process alignment okay with slq performing the test development in agile fashion managing the test script so uh, the resources are like you know rather than focusing on coding they are like focusing on the value add and improvements and uh, there is obvious risk you know less time in getting resources prepared because they quickly get adapt uh, as well who has a university which helps us like already pre-built uh, contents and uh, a documentation help is really helpful in you know, getting resources, a new resource on the board and you know uh, getting aligned with uh, the project development team, okay, and the testing team. Uh, I already spoke about this alignment with business processes since uh, cloud ERP is totally business process oriented application. Okay, so it's all interdependent uh, processes and models connecting with each other, common to use functionalities which was getting reused. Okay, so the heavy dependencies on the reusability factor 
and SLP helps really very good. SLP reviewers really helps in identifying the traceability and you know align with the business process. So customers are much confident that you know they can instead of like testing the scripts for model, they can test their entire script you know from your inception to end. So all like from procurement to purchasing to payments, right? So all the scenarios are uh, properly proved, uh, identified, bundled, and traced. Okay, under the uh, uh, SLK universe. Okay, uh, from the alignment perspective. So uh, yeah, you can you can run the reports based on your test uh, business process uh, business process streams, and you get those. Uh, validation quickly reported okay uh, and progress managed uh, accordingly so that really helps okay i already spoke about traceability but reporting i really like uh, a good dashboard uh, which slp provides as a pre built dashboards of in-house uh, dashboard which helps uh, not only the, the the function user but the power users uh, the integration uh, leads okay as well as uh, CFOs and uh, the executives really getting help from all these dashboards to have 360 degree of view of the test development process, the, uh, the test execution progress, the test management progress. So this is really on a fingertips and you know, it provides uh, art, uh, really artistic view uh, on your uh, reporting functionalities. Okay. Uh, integration it really helps because as it uh, goes almost step beyond and it tries to uh, help performing the rest apis uh, testing okay your uh, cicd are, uh, are natively integrated adapters are natively integrated so that gives uh, a more confidence of your user base okay or the developer base uh, to you know, uh, perform your integration testing thoroughly and you know go beyond uh over to erp cloud and uh, help other integrate you know integrated applications to uh write the scripts and perform the end-to-end -end integration as well so that's uh, really served uh, well okay. so here we go uh a capgemini partner slq okay to build uh the test automation suit for the cloud and e-business customers so uh, until now we have uh, you know really built uh, a good amount of uh, reusable scripts okay uh, as an intellectual property with help of SLQ. and uh, uh, that's all pre-built scripts or you can say is like reusable scripts okay uh, helping our customers okay in delivery uh, and these are like completely codeless all right so I already explained earlier, right? Uh, that it is no coding platform help maintaining, uh, reducing the maintenance cost, okay, and help improving the delivery factors. So, so this, uh, this, you know, this below uh, there are some bulleted uh, features, right? So eventually helping our customers uh, in 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 getting our test uh, test repository, okay align with their uh, their delivery okay and and the eventual shipping of the product okay from cloud as well as the business so uh, and you know these are like how it's being helped right uh, we can quickly uh, align the business process okay of customers with our uh, slp universe okay so let's say like we have you know four or five branches right now configured and customers needs two or three, then we can quickly showcase those uh, the end-to-end tools to a customer and you know uh, with customer confidence. So they are like it's completely thoroughly being uh, being completely developed in-house, and it's just a matter of releasing it on uh, customers' environment and help them in quickly validating the test case. Uh, now the entire entire package, entire universe, right? It's completely ready to built in or plug in with uh, with a mm. automatic release alignment of Oracle. So all your new uh, patch set, which is getting re released, okay, uh, being, uh, being 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 connected with uh, environment uh, indirectly with SLQ, okay, and then these scripts are getting completely revamped, 
validate it, retest it, you know, perform migration testing in automation manner, and uh, getting completely ready with the new patch set or the current patch set of uh, the cloud application. Okay. And that performs end to end validation because I think you maintains a really nice uh, or very good transparency and traceability. So, all your changes uh, and the reusability factor plays a significant role in performing end to end validation. And then of course, the parallel agents, the parallel execution uh, saves a lot of time in validation cycle. Okay. So, uh, as I already explained, that uh, SLQ has uh, inbuilt uh, agile test development and management application so the customers are like you know quickly get with uh, ready to go test plans okay for performing uh, their regression testing so all their changes are uh, completely version okay uh, completely version and manage under uh, ready to go test plans okay uh, also like you know customers like not limited to only the functionality testing or the out of box testing it actually go beyond uh, for the integration testing performing the rest api testing so customer ensure that you know they are like getting end to end service and manage their integrations uh, with the legacy application with their financial institution applications that will be with uh, completely quality assured with the help of SLQ and calculate or the universe been called as a Oracle Q universe, the SMQ universe. Thank you so much for listening to me. Hey, you Dave, welcome to uh, Excel Q Live. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great real world experience. So, thank you so much for that. We have a bunch of questions coming in. I guess the first one that someone asks is, let me see if I can get it on my screen here, is what's the basic meaning of no code? Um, you know, a lot of times people talk about no code as a buzzword, but you talked about it throughout your presentation. So how real is it? How much has it really helped you with uh, your automation? Uh, Joe, I just like lost uh, the, you know, uh, your voice somehow. Okay, so uh, someone yeah. wants to yeah, know. I, now I can. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you have the question? Oh, no, sorry. Can you say it? Yeah, yeah. The question is, uh, what's the basic meaning of no code, low code automation? Uh, you talked about it a lot in your session in the real world. So just curious to know to get, is it the real thing? Did it really help uh, any roadblocks you may have came, come across using it? Yeah. So basically, no code is, you know, uh, the, the platform where, right, uh, you can just you know, simply take a screenshot of uh, your navigation where you can see you know this is your you know navigation path uh, this is what the screens are okay and then you know capture your screenshots uh, that screenshots will automatically capture the events okay what is your navigation what is the next step right what are the input uh, parameters you're going you know going to add there such as like invoice number or invoice date i'm just you know giving the example and uh, automatically script is you know built okay uh behind the screens you know behind the screens and that really helps you know saving a lot of time where you go and actually do a coding you know try to identify the elements variables and you know put that in coding put it in the sequence identify the sequence steps so everything just goes you know beyond uh, uh beyond uh the screens the SLQ's uh intelligence box uh, you know, doing for you, you know, and not you are like, you know, uh, spending your time and, you know, getting it done and getting it wrong. And it, it works very fine. Okay. So that really helps like a, a user, a, a normal user or, you know, uh, a functional user, right? They can go and then they can you know, tweak the scripts on the fly itself where they know like you know, this is the business process change let's say 10 percent of change whatever they already tested right in another phases or another way and um, they can just take the screenshots and you know add their scripts and keep their scripts locally and and perform the validation on the fly so uh so that's the no code functionality which is we found it's very interesting and uh, very happening okay post slq we've got on code so I know prior to that release version, like you we were uh, totally involved with the coding, and that really helps, right? You know, our resources are like much confident; they are like really happy. Okay, so they have to manage, you know, the actual 
two test development execution cycle and you know they don't uh, spend much more time in execution and whenever there is a new person onboarded right uh, so it's easy for you know us to uh, give him a training okay and you know getting quickly uh, in helping our customers right to uh, build the scripts and perform the validation so in all the aspects right from the development to the execution to the management uh, the no code is really really helping part so hope i jo uh, answer your question uh, um, that's i think the short answer i believe absolutely so i'm just doing a quick uh, mic test hold on one quick uh, issue with audio so does someone hear echo when i'm talking or when uh Uday is talking let me know in the chat if everything's back to normal uh, but here's a quick test to hear an echo echo all right Uday, uh, next question is uh, how does uh, how do the pre-built codeless automation assets look like? Do they cover end-to-end -end scenarios? Yeah, so pre-built codeless uh, it's an end-to-end scenario. So when we say pre-built, you know what we mean is like you know uh, we know the standard process, okay, uh, specific to a customer industry, right? Let's say take the service industry, right? How their procurement to you know payments is a standard process is going to happen. Uh, we know like which comes first, which comes later, right? And uh, we know like the frequency of which you know the execution is going to happen. So if you consider like complete uh, uh, you know ERP process for that particular customer, uh, these everything right uh, with uh, you know specific to uh, their dimensions such as that particular legal entity or business unit, we try to mimic it. Okay, try to keep it aligned. So that you know, when you have similar industry customers, or not even like you know, non-similar industry customers, just you know, a different customers with uh, ten or twenty percent of weight into it, right? Uh, in that entire profit to pay cycle, we will be like easily you know, uh, easily adapt to that change and only fill in the gap and try to uh, you know, try to help here, right? So, uh, so these pre-built scripts, uh, when we already uh, already have our in in, in our in viewers pre-built, you know, it's just like when customer is uh, already there, we have to point this uh, environment to customer's environment, offload the scripts, okay, and uh, quickly go and making the changes that customers need, which could be like ten percent, twenty percent, and you know, get quickly aligned, uh, you know, with these data. Okay, uh, with uh, production data or whatever you know, uh, the test environment data, and quickly have our validation ready, right? So, uh, so that's the beauty of it. Like you know, when we when we keep building exponentially uh, our library, or you can say our universe, uh, that will really help uh, in you know uh, accelerating our delivery cycles and the execution cycle. So that gives a confidence to customer that our processes are well defined okay in, in the business process uh, manner plus you know uh, most of our scripts right it's already there right we are like we are not building from scratch and it's going to reuse for us we just need to like shift our data element okay and you know uh, provide our dimensions to it and uh, look right we are uh, seeing this sum of changes in the customizations and integration okay only focus uh, there okay and then uh, get our uh, scripts, you know, quickly built in agile fashion and validated as on when in each and every sprint, right? Because your development is uh, agile fashion and you need those scripts uh, to quickly validate. So, yeah, so that's how I think I try to, uh, you know, give you answer, uh, uh, you know, that we built uh, a simple, uh, you know, uh, environment and the universe for us. Okay. Nice. So kind of like non uh, no code is uh, an underlying application like Oracle can't have the same business flow and uh, business rules for different customers. So uh, are automation tools that have pre-built accelerators any good in such a case? Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, like this is true for every ERP, Joe. Okay, so, you know, uh, not even in the same industry, two customers are, you know, having the same processes, right? Uh, so different industry customers definitely will be deviation. So uh, yeah, that's a, like a uniform challenge in every ERP, not only in Oracle. Okay, but you know that gives you, uh, and that's where uh, accelerated tools, okay, such as as to testing platform, really helps because what we are achieving here is we are not like starting from scratch. Okay, 
and uh, when you take a ERP, okay, for two different customers, you know, same cloud application, okay, and cloud is like almost cloud enforce uh, customers to do a standard or go to the standard practice. Uh, you know, there are deviations, right? So that deviations will not be more than fifty percent, okay. If you consider it, it will be maximum thirty or twenty, you know, twenty to thirty percent. So uh, rest, like at least seventy percent, are ready with us, right? We don't need. Uh, to develop it from scratch, you know, we don't need to like, you know, configure and, you know, get it uh, done, uh, you know, from scratch to that new customer, right? So when you already have 70%, you have to just like manage 50% of CAN and uh, that can be managed easily, okay? Uh, so that's the advantage, right? No code is the advantage there, okay? You just like have your basic configurations ready, uh, you know, take a screenshot, go blah, 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 blah like, you know, uh, tick, 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 you know, all your steps are created and uh, get ready with your 30% you know, uh, changes. And again, like, you know, if you have integration testing, then SLP really helps, right? You know, you have your uh, inbound interfaces, REST API ready, you know, REST API is validated, you know, just take, uh, take the scripts out of like, your, you know, your standard script, when you take a data from your standard import table and uh, see whether your orders are generated, your invoices are generated, right? So I'm just like you know, giving example in that area, the finance area. So yeah, so that's uh, that's what it is, right? So uh, I think that we are just closing the gap. We are only focusing on the gap, and that's how like, we are we built on that platform. Uh, we have the package. You know, we we try to generalize, or I try to generalize the package with the standard and the best practices uh, throughout the industry. But uh, yeah, there are divisions, and you know, where uh, we have the functional team and uh the uh, the partners right the integrated partners works together and the certain environments help them validate the so yeah i hope i answered the question yeah absolutely good answer uh, how important yeah. do you think using no code testing platforms to empower business users is in a large organization like yours do you believe business users participate uh in participating in testing process can be beneficial yeah, of course it is beneficial. Uh, so, so basically, the no code approach and then test repository approach, uh, okay, it is really helping or curating a lot. Okay, so at the initial stage, right, when we are uh, in the, our development space, right, our build space, right. So what happens is, uh, you know, at that point in time, we, uh, you know, our uh, development team and QA team are uh, are very aggressively involved. Okay, and the business users, power users are like completely involved in uh, performing the development, performing the requirements, right? And then, you know, just validating uh, and, and providing the sign of based on whatever the QA has tested. Okay? So that initial part, uh, you know, your QA team is more uh, aligned. And the next part where, you know, your SIT comes in picture, UAT comes in picture, at that point in time, you know, your, your business users and power users, right, comes in, uh, comes in picture. Uh, again, uh, the way SLQ has actually, you know, built their tool and, you know, the way we try to, uh, we try to deliver, you know, uh, uh, package it or pack it into delivery that we try to help them in execution as well, okay? Because we have a parallel agents that they can, you know, perform the execution. We just like, you know, schedule that at night and come on the next day and, you know, you'll see all the results, right? So, uh, so we, we try to give less, uh, you know, uh, you know, less, uh, 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 less accessibility to power users but yes power users are like you know they they they, enact, they, they jump in uh, at that point in time when they have to you know perform uh, their part of validations and you know uh, specifically in UAT and pre UAT stages and then SIT stages they come up and then they uh, they, they they keep their uh, uh, copies of their uh, their best uh, scripts they modify it, they give it back, you know, to development and the development team or the QA team, and they help this uh, fixing a lot of scripts, right? Specifically, like there is a patches and all the other changes, right? The signature to this type the signature to this happens and all. So, uh, yeah, so they, their inputs are very important. Their contribution is really very vital, uh, which we think like it comes in that, you know, at that uh, end stage of our uh, implementation phase, but this is important and, you know, uh, the no code approach really helps those users. Uh, you know, they don't need to like code. You can just take a screenshot and, you know, get those uh, steps created, you know, connect with uh, uh, the QA team and, yeah, your script is ready. Half of them uh, at onshore, uh, you know, and in US time zones, offshore time zone is like, you know, uh, getting ready for uh, 
uh, planning the script. That's all. Man. It's so easy. So yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, the business is a uh, easy Perfect. Uh, probably have time for one last question. It is, do any of your clients have integrations with any other app, enterprise applications to Oracle app? And what's your take on test automation tools support for various integrations, thereby supporting really omni-channel and end type of testing scenarios? Yeah, integrations are inevitable though. Like, you know, we cannot exist without integrations. So there are integrations. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, there are type of integrations within cloud to cloud, within cloud integration, cloud to cloud integrations, cloud to on-premise integrations and vice versa. So uh, yeah, so uh, that's very crucial. And that's where we have a SIT, you know, SIT phase, uh, that's validation phase. And you know, it's very crucial for our business continuity plan and business continuity team to run through. So that validation is very critical. And without that, we cannot like even move to the next step. So, uh, yeah, and then, you know, uh, the, the, the way we look at the integration is right, you know, so uh, SLQ has really great feature is, you know, not only on uh, sticking to the cloud, but, you know, it has uh, adapters which go beyond cloud. And even if you go to the legacy application, try to you know, create uh, some short scripts. Uh, let's say, for example, like, you know, the order creation, uh, the triggering, those integrations are business event trigger base or, you know, the, it's a recurring uh, a, a recurring integration on a scheduled basis. So, you know, you just go beyond and then uh, uh, initiate that trigger, uh, which actually, you know, pulls the data into your, uh, uh, into, you know, uh, into your uh, interface tables and then, you know, the input uh, that data, right? So, so that's involved the end-to-end -end testing, the channel testing, plus, you know, it just like, uh, uh, it gives, a, it's a features of like a, uh, testing the APIs, right? So they, uh, uh, as you has an API testing uh, functionality, you know, you have your uh, data, uh, which is like completely mimic of all your third-party integration data, right? You know, you get it into the API fashion, load it, and, you know, get all your other stuff uh, tested, right? As if like it is coming from your, you know, third-party application or the external source of application or legacy application. So that's the beauty of it, right? So, uh, you know, you partially like half of your uh, uh, app and the system is tested. You know? uh, so, yeah, so REST API, uh, uh, like API testing, REST API, you know, uh, and part of like uh, your integration testing, uh, the inbound and outbound, yeah, that's a few uh, scripts are really helping. And um, it is uh, actually helping in uh, clearing one of the crucial, you know, uh, state like system integration testing. So, uh, and that helps, uh, gives the customer confidence and help in the entire uh, implementation team in the SAP app to uh, move uh, easily. So, yeah. All right. So, I, I lied. I, I just want to get to this one question someone asked in the chat. I just noticed it. Uh, they want to know, is there any documentation for the no-code approach um, that you can share? I don't know if you have any documentation on it or best practices type of doc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I believe that, uh, like, you know, as if you as a university, there are a lot of documentation white papers already published. Uh, while working with us, if you like, from, you know, uh, so long time, you know, we also have our team, uh, uh, I know, drafted some white papers and, you know, for no code uh, uh, approach and no code uh, specific, you know, uh, this thing, we have a details, right? So we can, yeah, we can share definitely. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Uday, for contributing to Excel Q Live. Really appreciate you. Great real world session. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Galjean, welcome to Excel Q Live. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you again. How are Good you? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm always excited for these events. I'm always learning something new myself, which I really appreciate as a host. So thank you for that. Great event so far. So thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, we couldn't be <coughs> happier uh, with uh, Heather and the session. They complemented each other's uh, um, you know, knowledge, what they shared, and uh, that was the perfect start to the event. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Gilgit, the floor is all yours. Uh, people have been asking for a live demo. I don't know if you're actually going to do one, but uh, I would tell them you would be, uh, teasing them, so hopefully you are. Uh, but, yeah, it's all you. 
Yeah, I'm glad I decided to do this uh, this live live, and uh, I just switched my order uh, because I I didn't want to start with slides no more. So yes. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna I'm gonna actually take uh, I'm gonna actually just pretty much start out before we go to Oracle Live and a lot more <laughs> conceptual stuff straight to what Uday was talking about, so that everyone can basically relate to uh, everything. Uh, kind of you know. Heather set us a really nice platform in terms of the strategy and how should you approach and really coming in from from the source itself. And then Uday really complemented it well with kind of, you know, um, how customers are doing it, how CAP is helping <laughs> customers, what is the pre and the post picture. So with that, you know, I'm going to just bring kind of a little bit of uh, a direct relationship to what Kind of what they was talking about, right? So if 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 uh, Joe, if you can, uh, if you if y'all can see my screen, yeah, right? Looks good. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, basically, this is kind of an example of a universe um, that uh, that Uday was uh, referring to, right? And you can see, you know, it it looks it looks pretty, uh, you know, pretty complex because it has a ton of stuff in there, right? Like if I just go to my uh, navigation, you'll see it has hundreds of scenarios or hundreds of pages with 200 plus steps in there and you can see the universe looking as as complex as it is right and for those of you who have uh, who don't know axel q um, that well right uh, you know they kind of touched upon um, you know the, the the different aspects of how the post axel q world looks like <laughs> but just to give you an idea this is something which is pretty unique to us we call it the universe um, think of it as an application flow diagram. Think of it as a blueprint of, of the application that you're testing. In this case, obviously, we're talking about Oracle, right? <laughs> and, and CAP and AxelQ kind of collaborated to create, uh, you know, something which brings the best of subject matter expertise, which, which is from hundreds of implementations CAP has gained, uh, CAP being a platinum partner of, uh, <clears throat> of Oracle, um, kind of, you know, has known a lot of flavors of different implementations, different industry verticals implement. And then obviously XLQ bringing in the modularity, right? The design first approach, which basically makes a new uh, way of, of, of creating these test assets, which are reusable, you know, uh, you know an old school accelerator based test approach, which are packages, accelerators have been around for, at least 20 years now, right? But the challenge with accelerators is they're static, right? I mean, there are days when, you know, for for a couple of years, uh, customers didn't used to have any upgrades and then they'll do a big bang upgrade. But with Oracle Fusion and, and, and more modern uh, software development practices, these are, uh, are pretty much changed in every release, which happens three to four times a year, right? <clears throat> so that's what makes these test assets uh, special. One is they have release alignment, which is real time. Nobody has to do an upgrade as such, right? And second is these are all configurable to any complex implementation. In fact, if I go in a particular scenario, right, <clears throat> you know, for instance, creating requisition on behalf of a field service engineer, each of these steps are nothing but these lines in the in 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 in, in the universe, which means. The more scenarios you create, the more behaviors you create, the smarter your universe is getting, which means think of it as this way, right? The universe is basically gaining more and more routes and directions, and it's like a map, which is getting smarter and smarter. So the more behaviors that are getting defined, the more steps uh, <coughs> are getting added to the universe, and it's automatically breeding that reusability and modularity. And that's, that's, that's the key. Right. If there is one thing you want to remember from from what I just talked about is is I'm not thinking object oriented terms. Right. I'm not thinking what do I need to reuse. Once I'm on a page, it tells me the universe tells me that hey, you know what? On this page, for instance, I'm on the receivables page. What are the actions my users can perform? And that what's that's what drives my uh, <clears throat> my 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 test scenarios. Right. Because if you think about it in abstract terms, what is a test? Right. It's a series of actions users perform, which takes them from one page to another page. And then this process, you validate against an expected outcome, right? So that those are the, the, the processes that are getting embedded as part of the universe and, and kind of bringing that uh, intuitive reusability and modularity. 
<laughs> and then if your one of your paid changes, let's go. Right, let's look at one of the pages. Let's suppose this page changes, manage transaction page. See how many objects are getting uh, interacted on this page. There are 13 different objects. It has a DOM capture across each of these pages. Let's suppose for a particular implementation, this changes. All I really need to do is basically tell my page that, hey, can you capture a new view? Can you record a new view for this page? <laughs> and downstream, all the different actions that are performed on this page, they could be part of a hundred different set test scenarios. I don't really, it won't really matter at that point, right? Because the, that referential integrity in universe will go out and propagate and basically take care of all the change management, right? Which is, which you all will agree, right? Which is where the rubber hits the road in automation, right? Uh, um, you know, when you scale up, how fast can you automate? Um, when you have changes, uh, right? Uh, uh, how fast? How fast can that change be managed, as opposed to reinventing the wheel in terms of uh, going through, you know, going through uh, uh, updates and changes, right? So let's look at one of the results. I think that would kind of bring a little bit more. Um, so you'll see this create acquisition uh, with the field uh, so, uh, engineer, right? Uh, and by the way, this can be run across multiple data permutations and combinations, and that is also part of the universe that CAP has built, right? Which means that all the values, which are pick list values, search values, data list of values, uh, will use an algorithmic approach to auto-generate the permutations and combinations of data. So there are several pick lists you'll see here, right? Which means that if I go to a particular scenario, I can use this little lightning button and it will come back and tell me what are the ideal permutations and combinations. It uses kind of a flavor of pairwise algorithm, but that's basically what it does. Because if you think about it in a particular test scenario, <coughs> there are many different data-driven inputs, right? For instance, a create requisition lines is more data input heavy, right? If I go in, in this scenario, you'll see a whole lot of logic in there that has certain conditional statements and so on, right? And you'll see everything right in blue here is, is basically your data-driven inputs, right? Which means, you know, you have to provide that data. Um, AxelQ supports both data-driven inputs, obviously, as well as other type of smart inputs, which means, like I was saying, you can have pick lists of values which are which can then help help you create new test cases without always putting an overhead on data, as well as you can have um, you know uh, uh, you can have global properties right here, which means you can align your inputs with your environment variables. You can also have uh, synthetic data generation, right? If I go within a within an action, and if you remember how uh, you know how Axel Q action works, you just start typing random or or synthetic, and <clears throat> and it'll it'll basically let you. You know, if I just start typing random, for instance, right? So, uh, you know, if you know Excel Q, the, the logic editor complements the recording. And, and basically, uh, you know, it's kind of powered by IntelliSense, right? So you don't really need to know exactly what, what command you're looking for. You can just start typing in English language, right? So I start typing random, and you'll see a whole host of synthetic data generation options there, right? So your data-driven would be kind of a combination of your uh, inputs that you provide as well as the synthetic data. Um, and then, you know, let's just go back to the results. I think it will help you kind of look at one of the executions. This is, by the way, how an execution report, which was done, uh, looks like, right? I can pretty much go into a verbose mode and it'll give me, just like how you saw in the logic editor, it gives me pretty much down to the last level of detail, right? How was an element interacted? What was the screenshot taken at each level? Or I can just go in kind of like this video mode where I can just browse through you know all the fifty six screenshots for this for this test scenario which were captured, right? And you know there is a little pop up here which exactly tells me how was the element interacted, what was the action, which is the step, and what is the page on which uh, this was happening, right? Or I can go into I can go into any one of these details. Let's suppose I want to see you know when uh, let's go into creating a requisition line, right? Let's suppose when you know when when the create line line acquisitions were being added, and you know how complex Oracle UI can get, right? If I click on this eye icon, it tells me exactly how the selectors were built, what are the statements, how much time each interaction is taking, right? And if I click on the element ID, it tells me exactly what element is getting interacted and what was the selector built for that element by Axel Q, um, by Axel Q's AI algorithm, right? And so on. And obviously, as you, if you know Axel Q, it gives you kind of full visibility into each of these. Right, 81 different objects you can see got interacted, right? And if I want to see certain complex objects, right, like container objects and so on, I can click on it and it gives me kind of 
a good view into kind of, you know, uh, what was the combination of elements across the DOM. And that could be hidden within uh, any kind of structure, whether it be a shadow or a, or a nested DOM or so on, right? Uh, and and it will come back and make that match. But it gives you visibility. So as an automation engineer, you know exactly what's going on. And if you have more intelligence on it, you can kind of almost play around with the DOM and say, hey, you know what? I know that this would make it more robust in handling. How about I add this to the locator on top of what Excel Q is suggesting, right? So it kind of gives you that flexibility of, of bringing your intelligence about an application um, you know, aligned with this. But the advantage of this is the underlying processes are being aligned with Oracle's releases. So if tomorrow they try to, uh, which they do, right? Which they, if they, if they try, they, if they change certain objects, right? Using from a shadowed on based object to a more dynamic object, right? Uh, the definition would have would not have to be changed, and if 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 it gets renewed, like I said, this page is centralized. It could be used in any number of scenarios. In fact, if I go to um, an action, right, and if for instance create journal, if I just right click on create journal and say action references, see right here that referential integrity of universe I was talking about, it tells me what are the scenarios. In fact, it also tells me what step of the scenario it's getting used for. Right, um, I could go into this and I could pretty much. Uh, also govern what is my universe flow, which means which pages this would be applicable to, right? Um, and, and that kind of gives you the design level modularity, but more in a functional kind of a business sense, um, right? So I know I went really fast. This was uh, this was a little bit of a, an addition to, uh, to what everyone's been asking for. So I wanted to make sure uh, we give you a good uh, sneak peek into, uh, into some of the things uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the awesome things uh, they had shared, right? Um, um, with this, I'm going to take, you know, a, a, a new, uh, quickly uh, switch gears to a new topic that that we wanted to give you a quick sneak peek into. Um, and then we can we can do a bit of uh, questions. Uh, you know, I want to be respectful of the time also. Um, but, you know, if you've, if you've understood what, what uh, Heather and, and Uday shared and, and a bit of uh, understanding of, of how a universe uh, gives you a kickstart into doing your Oracle testing and how it's aligned with releases, um, you know, with, uh, with ExcelQ Live, and if you followed ExcelQ Live this year, um, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've launched ExcelQ Live earlier this year. You know, our first edition of ExcelQ Live um, had covered Salesforce. Um, right, which which has been uh, one of our strategic partners, and and uh, we covered that a couple months back in in the in in one of the editions in 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 our Q Live event. Um, <clears throat> in this one, we are also introducing uh, Oracle Live, right? And I'm, I'm I I couldn't be excited. Uh, you know, we 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 always knew Oracle was on cards, but the way uh, this whole partnership worked out, and now we are official Oracle ISV partners. Uh, <clears throat> we are actually on their marketplace and and the whole nine yards right we uh, uh, you know the 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 oracle live brings basically everything you saw in the universe that i showed you a live uh, a, a live aspect to each and every uh, uh, thing that you saw right which means uh, the alignment is now not just limited to an object interaction but Oracle Live basically takes it, you know, think of that universe now on steroids, right? So what that really means is not just the elements which, which, which were part of the real-time alignment. Now there are live actions, which means think of it this way, that in a particular, uh, let's take Oracle Fusion, accounts payable, accounts receivable, journal creation, these modules as probably one of the most uh, uh, prom, you know, most prominent implementations across Oracle suites, Oracle Fusion and eBusiness suites, right? Now think of it this way that these behaviors, which are most common within an account payable, account receivable, uh, creating journals, these modules are, you know, if you think about it, the behaviors are common, which means the steps the users perform are pretty common. So what Live does is basically pre-builds these steps, but in the same modular fashion with underlying alignment to a central cloud tenant, which means your actions, your behaviors are getting inherited, we being a cloud native platform through a central tenant, which is directly associated and aligned with an Oracle release, right? 
So it really brings that live to a real life manner, right? Um, and 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 there are a ton of Oracle pre-built components in our first release related to Oracle Fusion Cloud, right? Obviously, it brings the multi-cloud integrated uh, automation, which means um, you know, as if if you if you know Excel Q, uh, a scenario in Excel Q, for instance, what I was showing you is 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 pretty technology agnostic, right? It can it doesn't matter whether you're in the Oracle context or. Uh, whether your Oracle is, for instance, integrated into an upstream, downstream, uh, a, you know, uh, application like a thick client application or a microservices or a database call or, um, you know, or or other uh, ERP applications may be, you know, may be, uh, you know, your Microsoft Dynamics or Salesforce or Workday or what have you, um, right? So that's basically kind of a combination of what, what Oracle Live brings to the table, right? Um uh, you know, just like your newer age Oracle Fusion, uh, it pretty much has cross-platform compatibility in terms of any kind of Oracle uh, stack, but it doesn't need, obviously, any programming when you handle these test assets. It does align with the quarterly releases Oracle brings to the table. And trust me, that has created havoc with traditional test automation practices. Um, AxelQ had pretty much streamlined it with everything you heard from Uday uh, to the customers, but live just brings, uh, you know, that 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 sweetness to the pace at which Oracle is increasing those releases and the window at which Oracle is reducing your preview times, which means you have to pretty much adopt in a particular timeline, right? So with that, uh, again, what you what you've always asked for, I'm gonna show you actually a quick sneak peek into the Oracle Live is, itself also. So I'm going to just show you a blank project. Let's suppose this is a blank project. No universe exists. None of my assets exist, right? If I just go into the administration of this project, here's you'll see the marketplace, right? The marketplace is where all my apps exist in terms of where I can inherit my live assets from, right? So I have Salesforce. I have MS Dynamics. Um, you know, a whole bunch of others are coming in the pipeline, right? I'm just going to go and add this. Uh, Oracle Live into my project. And if I go back to my project, you'll see I don't have scenarios, but if I go into my actions, see right here, I have browse live add-on actions. <coughs> In the same project or across projects, I can keep adding different live add-ons, right? If I click on this, you'll see a whole host of live add-ons come in, which basically tells me that Live add-ons are something which are pre-built behaviors which are now inherited and are ready to go in my project. So if I now go and let's suppose I create a new uh, scenario, right? Let, let's suppose uh, I need to create a new journal and validate uh, the entry uh, of requis requisitions, right? And then let's say save and continue, and I and and this opens up my uh, my process designer, right? My behavior designer. Let's say I start adding steps. And now because I'm part of a live project, if you see on this bottom uh, bottom left, uh, check this out, right? Uh, hopefully you can see it. It's, it's, in, it's a little bit smaller when I'm sharing my screen. But if you see here, it actually tells me which release alignment my live add-on is related to, right? And it actually tells me if, if there was an upcoming release, it would actually give me a little prompt saying, hey, do you want to, re do you want to actually refresh your live add-on? Uh, to your latest one so that all your assets also get that refresh, right? So it gives you a little confirmation prompt rather than kind of forcing you forcing it to you. So if you wanted to run it across multiple environments, you could actually all, also run it across multiple environments even if you were to uh, uh, release it. That's kind of the beauty of, of how live works. But uh, let's suppose I've verified all of that. I have my live actions. What do I really need to do, right? I want to invoke a browser, obviously. But now... If you've known Excel queue, it's not just invoking a browser. It tells you, hey, I can invoke and actually log into your application and see right here, it says this is a live action. You know, why not, right? I, it makes sense for me to, 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 to just use a behavior which will help me log in. And see, this login is not just about just logging into an Oracle application. Obviously, um, that can be done with, you, you know, with, with, with whatever steps need to be taken. But this live action makes sure that Whatever changes are brought by Oracle, Oracle may introduce multi-factor authentication and make it mandatory for every customer to use multi-factor authentication. Axel Q's partnership with Oracle will ensure how multi-factor authentication is embedded as part of the login page is taken care of by this live action behavior. 
But it doesn't mean it stops you from parameterizing, from making it modular, from making it your own, right? So it tells me, hey, what are the things that are needed for login, right? Obviously, I can do it literal or I'll say, hey, you know what? I want to environmentally align it. So I'm just going to say, when I choose a test environment, use those properties. When I choose uh, a different environment, so I'm going to just use parameterization to environmentally align it, right? Like I always say, there are many levels of parameterization you can use, right? So in this case, I'm using environment parameterization. It's asking me which page will it lead to. So even though the behaviors are getting embedded, that's why it's not the old school test steps and it's not forcing you on the page modules because the pages could be your own, right? Every Oracle implementation would like to name its own pages because they have their own flavor of their fields and, and how they kind of modularize those pages, right? So let's suppose I'm going to call it the home dash page on which this leads me to. Uh, <clears throat> now it's telling me what are the different behaviors you want to add on the home dash page, right? The, you know, for now, I just want to add let's suppose a couple of behaviors like navigation and so on, right? You can always <clears throat> keep changing it on that page. <clears throat> this is just an initial introduction to that, right? From the home page, <clears throat> what do you want to do, right? Let's suppose I want to initiate a new task because I want to create a new journal, right? I initiate a new task. What does it lead me to? For now, it's you know it's going to be on the home dash page because that's where the menu is, right? <clears throat> From the home dash page, what do I want to do? I want to, you know, I want to basically open an action item, and I can keep going on and on, right? These are all my live actions, which are basically allowing me to create <clears throat> a complete flow, like clicking on navigation menu, initiating a new task. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, too much talking. So if I if I have to draw a parallel, if 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 there are some folks here who've been using XLQ, right? If I go into one of the uh, one of the earlier uh, flows that I had, you would see, <clears throat> you know, uh, and and just to drawing drawing the parallel of login to application, right? If I go login to application in in my pre live world, right? I would have views. I would basically capture a view, and then I would go about recording it like in a in a in a, in a manner uh, i can record my automation i would right click i would say enter text blah 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 right but if i go into one of my live actions and i say invoke and browser uh, uh, log into application i don't have any logic i don't even handle elements i don't even handle any kind of recording and views right all it tells me is what are the inputs you can make into this and what are the outcomes you're going to get out of it right so this inherited action is truly a live action connected to kind of a, you know, a cloud tenant, right? Uh, and <clears throat> if I go into some of the custom actions, for instance, populating a new, new journal, you would be wondering that, hey, you know what, if I want to populate a new journal, I still have to do the recording because my fields are my own, but that's not how live works. So it's not just the complete steps you're getting uh, visibility into. You actually also get uh, <clears throat> live uh, statements, which means that, it's not just a complete step which is kind of blocking you out. You can create your own action and just start typing enter, and it will give you Oracle-based special commands which will allow you to interact with fields just by giving its values, which means I can say, hey, you know what? Enter this field a journal in a journal named field, but I don't have to do any recordings or handle any objects. I just start typing in an English language manner saying, you know what, I just want to enter a text in an editable grid of an Oracle, right? And see right here, it's basically showing me that these are my normal actions, which are, if I were to record it in a traditional manner, right? Um, and these are my live actions, which are basically directly allowing me to record it without, um, without actually going into object identification and screen recordings and so on. Um, all I need to have a functional knowledge of what the field is called, and I can start interacting, whether it be drop down, whether it be something even more complex, like, you know, uh, an editable grid or, or, or what have you, right? Um, and if we look at a quick result into what was recently executed, you'll see here, you know, uh, it basically goes through creating a new journal. Let's go through the quick motion of it, right? Um, and then creating new requisition lines. Uh, right within the journal, the journal lines, and then coming back and 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 doing a verification whether it was indeed a manual line or not. Right. So if I go back in one of the steps, um, right, 
which is where kind of that that validation happens, right? Uh, adding the line and then doing the validations. But you'll see that there are no objects interacted. Everything is being inherited pretty much through that live action, uh, which which has been taken care of, right? So, you know, again, you know, if you have to draw a parallel, it's it's really taking this universe concept, you know, and putting it on steroids in terms of, uh, you know, how live can kind of further speed up and align uh, you know your your releases, um, and that's pretty much the two key topics I wanted to cover and and, and complement. Um, you know what were the, the the things you heard from uh, Heather and 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 Uday. So Joe, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you. Awesome stuff. So I'm just curious to know. He uh, Uday was saying uni uh, universe, and I thought he was saying university. So someone had a question about. Um, how, how do they know how to write a low code, no code script? He said, well, the universe has examples. So is the universe generated automatically or is it just generated based on every test you add? And does it give you an example of how to write a no code, low code script? Or does it walk you through the process? Yeah, absolutely. So a universe is generated automatically, right? So, um, you know, as you define your behaviors, the universe pretty much starts coming together. So I'll show, I was just switching around to show you a, a simpler version of the universe, right? So as you create more and more behaviors, the universe starts coming together. Um, there are a couple of ways you can do it, right? Uh, if, you, if you're using live, then you're, you're getting a lot of live actions, but the behaviors are for you to create because your end-to-end -end workflows are something that you would want to cater to your implementation. So that's something that you govern. But the more behaviors you create, the smarter the universe becomes. Or you can go with something like, you know, like, like Uday was talking about, which is how CAP helps customers, right? Which is basically going and getting different versions of universes and starting with that and then, and then fine tuning um, your implementation to these universes. And to answer the second part of your question, it does uh, give you uh, kind of uh, the, the, on, on how to write low code, no code, right? So, Let's go in one of the steps. It will make it easier to understand, right? Let's go in one of these steps. So the way uh, no code no code works is there is, by the way, in Axel Q. I know we are all so used to hearing no code no code. There is no code in Axel Q. In Axel Q, it is purely no code. So as you record these screens and you right click, right click on your fields, it actually gives you suggested statements and interactions on that field. And when you click on something it actually types it on on that logic editor for you. But I right? see an if statement, so it, Gulji. You said there's no code. I see an if statement there. <laughs> very good question. Very good question. So the way the way we we, we, talk, we we talk about this logic editor is, see, that's been the problem, Joe, in, in, in the world of no-code automation, right? Uh, if you go back 20 years, every record and playback tool limits you with without real-world automation. Okay. What this does is it gives me recording right here I can click, I can record, I can do verification through my recording, but it gives me a logic editor, which is non-scripting based. Uh, uh, the definition of code is it is syntax based. A syntax is something which I have to follow. This is non-syntactical, mm. which means I just start typing what occurs to me, right? I have to make a database call. I don't need to know a syntax. I just start typing data. Data occurs to me. Joe to you, DB may occur. Right? This is machine learning based algorithm, which gets smarter based on your behaviors. So whatever occurs to you. So think of an IntelliSense. When you search Google, do you really need to know a phrase when you search? You don't, right? You kind of just start typing and it's intelligent enough to autocomplete you, right? So I start typing data, DB. Let's suppose I needed a PDF file validation here. I start typing PDF and it gives me a host of PDF based interactions I can do, but I'm not knowing any syntax. Once I select, it's basically an autocomplete telling me, hey, let's configure this interaction based on the input values you want, right? So similarly, if I want to run a conditional statement, if will occur to me. And then right here, it will tell me, hey, you could write a conditional statement and it will give me the whole framework. And now I can just type my verification, right, of what kind of verification I want to write. So it is non-syntactical and it's more kind of intuitive compared to learning any, any level of uh, you know, specific programming or scripting. Right? But I need to know the order of things, right? Is it procedural? Is it like when I start typing at line 114, I, it assumes I, that I set up a variable or something to interact with, right? 
That's right. But if it if you if you choose a local variable, it'll tell you that hey, you haven't defined one. Oh, Why nice. don't you use a literal value? Okay. So the whole thing is context sensitive. So it'll keep prompting you to basically help you along the way. Love it. Love it. Very cool. And and that brings that brings the real world aspect to your recording, right? So right. that's kind of where the both ends of spectrum can meet, but without kind of injections, right? And what I liked about Uday's uh, session is uh, he mentioned no code, low code uh, multiple times. And so it seems like it really, you know, how you said it's like a buzzword in the industry, but he's utilizing it for a huge, huge company and being successful with it. So it was just good to see in here for sure. Totally. And, and for all the automation engineers who love code, you know, the reason I still also use it, low code, no code is, is here's the reason, right? We have something pretty cool called user extensions, which means you're not limited by Excel queue's ability, right, to, to, to extend this platform. You know, when I start typing DB Joe, you probably saw a whole bunch of databases there, right? You saw Postgres, you, you saw relational, non-relational, um, you saw, you know, uh, uh, Hive DB, Snowflakes. But let's suppose you have a, a Cosmos DB, right, or an Azure DB, which is just getting in introduced. You don't want to wait for Axel Q. Those, those, those days are old school days where you would hit a vendor and say, hey, when are you getting my support for, I'm an automation engineer. I want to control my own fate, right? So that's kind of where we bring in the code angle. So our code angle is different than, than what's, what's understood in the industry. The industry says, hey, you know what? I have a tool where you can put in a code injection, but what we say is that's no good, right? You sh- you, for your, your automation engineers, if you have 100 automation engineers, everyone should not be writing wrappers because it's going to make, make a mess of your automation. We say that you know, some of your core engineers, which are part of your COE team, can extend the framework so that everybody can take advantage of it. So you import it and everybody else gets the natural language for also handling that Cosmos DB that somebody has added. So you're not waiting for the vendor. The community is adding so if I were to just share my screen one more time, right, you know, you can go to academy.axelq.com and you can pretty much see, uh, you know, on a real-time basis, how extensions are being added by our community. Somebody is doing XML testing, somebody is doing CSV testing, somebody is adding, you know, Cosmos DB, right? So we made it more marketplace-driven where you can pretty much control your own fate in terms of how you add. So that's where, Joe, to your point, our code angle comes in, that, the, 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 it's not a black box you're handling. You can extend XLQ as a platform to adopt to new technologies, right? It's, it's coming in almost on a daily basis, right? Very nice. So how automated is the sync up with the Oracle if they push a, push the patch? So if I'm running my test in CI, I don't know, they, they push the patch. Do the tests automatically adjust themselves or do I need to go in and, and do something manually to update them? Like say, yes, update it or sync up with the patch. So if you if you set that add-on that I showed you, if you set it to auto-update, you don't have to do anything. Nice. It's your choice. In some cases, customers don't want anything pushed down right. their throat, yes. so they'll <laughs> they'll get a little prompt. They'll get an annoying prompt on that left bottom that hey, you're on twenty two B while Oracle's on twenty two C. Do you want to update? Do you want to update? Right. So um, you can you can choose that setting. Nice. All right. So let's get some quick questions right here uh, that people submitted ahead of time, I believe. First one is, can you share a little bit more on Q Marketplace and how partners can contribute to the same? I think you mentioned it uh, about the Academy, how people are submitting it. Is that the same as QMark? Um, QMark, basically, t- Academy is a, is a little bit kind of more on the, on the side of uh, the technology stacks. Uh, our Marketplace is especially on the, the, uh, the live uh, uh, packaged applications, right? Um, you, you know, so this is an example of a marketplace where you have Oracle, Salesforce, <laughs> MS Dynamics. We are adding. <laughs> I think the next event we are going to be doing, if I were to reveal, would be uh, on on Microsoft Dynamics. Yes. So you'll see a Microsoft Dynamics one. Um, you know, uh, very quickly, the Workday one is in works. Uh, SAP uh, one is in works as well. So a whole lot uh, actually, and Sino on the banking side. Uh, is 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 pretty much baked, and a lot of customers are already using it. You don't see it, so yeah, a lot of action happening on the Q marketplace. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons, um, you know, Uday shared what he shared was um, there are two aspects to the marketplace. 
one the vendor themselves can be uh, can add uh, you know their their uh, their 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 uh, their apps to it like for instance encino as an app company has decided to add their own uh, uh, you know a uh, uh, live add on to the marketplace um, and then you have partners who can also add as well as axel q may also decide to add so we do realize that you know this is a, the space where multiple uh you know uh, multiple parties so to say come in with with their intelligence right everybody kind of comes in from a different angle so a marketplace would also allow um, you know uh, cap gemini for instance to position its uh, its live add on so that not just their customers but even other excel queue customers who are doing oracle testing may not be caps customer will be able to leverage uh, you know uh, their their live add on so it's it's kind of like an app store but more for your packaged enterprise vertical solutions uh, apps cloud apps all right so i guess we have time for one last question it's along the same lines i guess it is are there any plans to have excel queue live for other niche enterprise apps like uh, copa so can copa add it themselves or do they have to be integrated with you uh, through your own back channels yeah absolutely copa can can add it themselves as well and by the way just like how they showed uh cooper uh, uday showed uh, um, you know um, oracle fusion uh, the universe and and pre and post um you know if 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 there is interest and maybe that's a good poll question um, we can throw out uh, at the end of the event uh, as a feedback is if there is interest in in certain apps let us know we've done cooper for various customers uh, universe already exist you know we are going with how much traction we get from from the feedback from our community and our customers and that's how we onboard live add-ons for each of these enterprise apps so coupa universe already exists um you know uh, you know let us know if if that's something which we get traction on we can bring that on as a live add-on or we can work with a customer uh, a partner like cap or coupa themselves to bring it on perfect so Galjit, that's actually all the questions we have. Before we go, there is any parting words of wisdom or how why Anthony want to leave or uh, I'll wrap up Excel Q Live for Oracle? Um, no, I think we covered it all. I I, I just want to take a second and thank uh, Heather and Uday for yeah. doing uh, for coming in and 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 really um, you know starting this event on Oracle at the right note. We wanted to bring in um, you know the the all the different aspects of how Oracle testing should be thought of. uh before getting into kind of you know the automation integrities and and the efficiencies the gain with excel queue and so on so yeah i appreciate their time and and as always uh you know uh, i'm excited for the next one absolutely and gilji really great demo as well so i want to thank you as well as for being one of the speakers today also and thank you everyone big round of applause for helping participate so thank you again gilji really appreciate you thanks joe thanks, thanks everyone time. for joining all right see you later cheers cheers All right, another wrap on Excel Q Live second edition Oracle. I like I said I learn something every time I host these events, so I'm really lucky. Thank you everyone for participating. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Big round of applause for helping us make this a very awesome event. Thank you everyone. Cheers. As always, test everything to keep the good.